We start every episode laughing. Hey, welcome everyone to the Mr. Teacher, Mr. Preacher podcast YouTube channel. I am Kevin. That's Jake. We are here to learn what lasts in athletics and teach and preach it back to you. In that vein, we are in our cooperation series of John Wooden's Pyramid of Success. This is the fifth block on the bottom of his famed pyramid that was made as of this recording 75 years ago. And we're taking a second look at that to see how can we be more successful um, as athletes, coaches, parents, whatever venue you have. And we're going to share those strategies with you in our second look here. Uh, today, we are going to be checking out Jane McGonigal's book, Reality is Broken, Why Games Can Make Us Better and How can They Can Change the World. Uh, a, a book about games and cooperation of all things. We're going to teach you the value of trash talking, uh, why you should visit cemeteries every year with your team, uh, why you should copy World of Warcraft and Halo 3, and why games are the vehicle for more cooperation, instant cooperation and collaboration, Jake. That is where we are going. Great to see you. Um, kick us off, good sir. I'm ready to roll when, whenever you are. Well, I'm a little concerned because before we turn the camera on, you're talking about invoking, invocation. Invoking. Okay. Well, the, the, the meaning or the definition of invoking <laughs> is to call on or summon someone, such as a deity or spirit, especially for help. And so, in other words, you're summoning dead people. Now you're talking about visiting cemeteries and, you know, all the conspiracy theories that go along with World of War or, yeah, World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft, is that what it is? I'm getting a little concerned here. Where are we going with this? You tell me games. I don't know. This innate spirit of cooperation. I don't okay. know, Jake. Just, on, just... That note, on that note, I'm going to pray for our time before we, we find ourselves in the land of the dead. Uh, 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 oh, Heavenly Father, that. yeah, thank you so much for uh, another great day and, and friendship and uh, brotherly love. I uh, pray that you would bless our time and uh, that this message and, and our conversation would be edifying to those who listen and that uh, we would really pull out the meaningful and lasting things in life uh, that we can pull from sport and athletics um, and just being together with other people. We thank you for that blessing of friendship and cooperation and uh, the wonderful things that can come from it. Um, so again, I thank you for this time. I thank you for Kevin and I thank you for our audience. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Jake, I am airing out some laundry of our past on you. And this is a great place to start. And I need you to know that it's not super serious laundry, but it was really quite a weak spot for me that only you really knew about. That was very apparent, very early on, very present every moment of this game. Now, this was a game that we did not play often, but it was very popular for a huge segment of time, along with another game that came along with it. And obviously, I'm delaying telling you what it is. Um, but it, it it had a highly entertaining fail sequence. It was so over the top you couldn't laugh, you couldn't help but laugh at yourself. You had this performance bar, and if it went in the red zone, you'd get booed. But if you were starting to lose, you would just muster up even more energy to be even worse than you already are you got an exact percentage readout of how far this how far you got uh before being booed but you would you actually really appreciated your partial success so if you got a a 30 percent oh can we get a 50 percent? can we get 75 percent? and this game is really quite interesting because it allows us to be vulnerable with each other and the game i am referring to jake is one of the most popular choices for live video game tournaments of all time, the game Rock Band. Now, <laughs> why, why am I so frustrated and I haven't forgiven Jake in about, God, we're about 33 of this recording. <laughs> why have I not forgiven him since we played that probably close to 20 years ago? Here is why, people. And he knows. He's waiting for it. There are roles in Rock Band. Rock Band is a game where you play songs, there's drums, there's a guitar, there's a microphone. Sometimes you could have two guitars and somebody be the bass. So you can imagine that some people get roles that they do not want to. I was one of those people. I was the guitar guy. Well, of the three of us, you know, Jake likes drums. My brother's not going to be the singer. 
So he's going to play the bass because it was the easiest, easiest one. Sometimes the guitar on the easy level. And that only left one person to sing. And that was me. Now, I I knew very early in our parochial school days that I was not going to be a choir boy. It was very apparent. I don't have that gift. And so what ended up happening is I joined band. And I was good at band, right? You just toot on your horn. I have a history of family members in band. And we're good. We play brass instruments, low brass. But no, Jake has me playing the role of singer in rock band, specifically, not just any song like rock song where I can just kind of be mediocre. No, we're going to we're going to on repeat do Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer. OK, and I'm not even going to you can guess how that probably went. Hey, guys, that was awesome. Let's play again. How about we not play again? It was one of the only times in Jake's camaraderie or cooperate i did not want to play again okay oh that can't be true oh it's terrible and like i mean when you're go i mean if you're if you're singing bon jovi you gotta go for it even if you don't get it and it's it's not only physically exhausting if you haven't trained your windpipes it's emotionally exhausting jake i'm emotionally exhausted 20 years later at the at the every time that song comes on i have fears of like sweat of trying to perform this crappy song with you in rock band. So take me back to rock band. You always wanted to be a drummer. What did you think of the game rock band before we start our study on games? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I loved it. That's a great memory. I I would contend that you probably wanted to quit many more games than just that. <laughs> How brutal we were to you in <laughs> video games. I'll bet so too. You're probably the most musically inclined, all three of us. And we That's stuck fair. you on the microphone. Yeah. Definitely. And I just would bang away at the drums and Kurt would do his bass thing and we were rocking out, loving life and, and you <laughs> You have to remember this is like mid puberty. So you would get like free, you know, like squeaks. Like I mean you would get like some low notes, like you could pretend. Like this is like half a testicle dropping at a time. Like it was just <laughs> No, that is so true. That is that is so true. Yep. Um, you know what? But you're a good soldier. You you, you pushed on. You got through it. Uh, you allowed me and Kurt to have a blast while you were miserable. And so we thank you for that. We appreciate you. Uh, it wasn't so it was, for that. For the record, it wasn't that bad. It was just that particular song, which was outside of my range. Some other songs are much more friendly. I'm like, can we just play a different song? No, we gotta get to. We gotta. We gotta beat the song. I know, no doubt I played on easy. So, and you know, and you know, <laughs> for the audience, right? Like you, you see, you see what notes he's hitting. Well, like while you're drumming, right? So I'm like, I'm doing the thing here and I'm watching the screen. And then like, you'd see his, his voice go this way and the note go that way. And so <laughs> just by nature, <laughs> me and Kurt would just rip him apart. <laughs> we'll see I, I didn't have the ability to read the screen to match the pitch. Like, that's actually how you play. How I was playing was much more intuitive. Like, you try and match what you're hearing. Sure. And also, and that, and that algorithm was meant for pitch in the microphone, which was what made it cool. But I wasn't reading that. I was reading, like, what I imagined the song sounded like in my head. And obviously, these, those did not match. Um, so every once in a while, I'd get booed off, and they'd save me. J Jake would, like, go crazy. There was, like, a saving mechanism in the failure sequence. So <laughs> great game, by the way. Great, great game. game. Great, great game. game. Yep, great so, game. So the reason why I wanted to start there is one for your amusement. But that becomes a platform for what we're going to talk about because games are the vehicle – for cooperation and i want to start with a warning okay so i'm going to go through our first draft we're going to go through some comprehension things jake just pause me whenever something stands out to you but some things you need to know about games from jane mcgonagall's reality is broken she did do our language of enthusiasm super better that was her second book we talked about that as like just being playful in your language and your approach and your mindset this is much more practical and tactical for like you're actually what you're going to actually do this was her first book, heavily researched, just like she always does. Um, so I want to start off with the warning, is that people who continue to write off games will be at a major disadvantage in the coming years. 
Those who deem them unworthy of their time and attention won't know how to leverage the power of games in their communities, in their businesses, in their own lives, or even in what I would say is athletics. Okay? They will be less prepared to shape the future, and therefore they will miss some of the most promising opportunities we have to solve problems, create new experiences, and fix what's wrong with reality. Here's what we know about game developers and game designers and game design. Game developers know better than anyone else how to inspire extreme effort and reward hard work. They know how to facilitate cooperation and collaboration at previously unimaginable scales. And they are continuously inventing new ways to motivate players to stick with harder challenges for longer and in much bigger groups. Game design isn't just a technological craft. It's a 21st century way of thinking and leading. So uh, I, again, I, that is the definition of a coach. I mean, think if, if you're a coach and you thought of yourself that way. How would that change how you would go about coaching and, and planning practices and how you operated within your practices? It was very, it was very interesting. Okay. Oh, it, it gets better. Games in the 21st century will be a prime, or I would say the primary platform for enabling the future. Let's continue with that. So there are three parts to this book. We're only going to kind of pick and choose. Um, obviously, if you're interested after this episode, go get the book, bookshop.org. Amazon, wherever you get your books. But here are three things. Part one is why games make us happy. We will linger here in this first draft and it'll come up in our second. Um, but games are successful games are carefully en engineered to provoke those feelings um, that we experience during a good game, like we were describing during Rock Band. Part two is reinventing reality, which is about alternate reality games. We're going to touch on a lot of those and how we were can what's called mod them to accomplish our goals of cooperation. And then part three was how very big games can change the world. The promise that Jane makes is this, the people who understand the power and potential of games to both make us happy and change reality will be the people, coaches, athletes, parents who invent our future. By the time you finish reading this book, or at least this episode, you will be an expert on how good games work. That is very key. So how do good games work? That's a really good question. Games, if you strip them down, and this was a key part of my study on Autotelic Athletics, it was my white paper with the Flow Research Collective, is if you strip it down, games have four things. Number one is a goal, like a specific outcome. Number two is rules or restrictions that limit players on how to achieve that goal. Number three is there's a feedback system, like you have to know how you're doing on set goal. Could, could be lots of different ways to do that. Points, level, score, progress bar. The game is over when. And the last one is voluntary participation, which are the flow triggers autonomy and sense of control. Meaning every game that you play, you're voluntary choosing to take on an obstacle. Which brings us to the definition that I'm going to skip way ahead to uh, from B Bernard Suits. Bernard Suits is a philosopher. And uh, Jane says it's the single most convincing and useful definition of a game ever advised. And the reason why I'm saying this is it makes it accessible to anybody. You don't have to be a World of Warcraft dungeon master or play video games in every spare moment of your time to leverage this. And then we're going to talk about that. But playing a game, according to Bernard Suits, is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. Attempt to come uh, unnecessary obstacles it explains everything that is motivating and rewarding of, and fun about playing games is that you choose to take on these weird obstacles. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to that because I got a I got a sport I got to pick on for Jake. But to convince you further is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, our godfather of flow, said that games are an obvious source of flow and play is the flow experience par excellence. Pair that. Um with the, the quintessential. So games are called the quintessential autotelic activity. We play them sheerly for the intrinsic reward. Csikszentmihalyi's solution was that to create more happiness or cooperation or success, we should structure real work, our practices, even though it is a game. Within that game, we should uh, structure them like game work. Uh, there was a game mentioned, it was kind of like Pong, but this guy mastered it. And he gave a quote about that in a game format, you can go from zero to peak experience in 30 seconds flat. If you structure it accordingly, 
there is no avenue or container that I'm aware of that gets you in the moment as quick as a game when it's designed correctly. So as soon as the, do, 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 you know, like the opening to living on a prayer goes in, like you're in, right? I mean, you're getting ready um, or it's like a journey or don't stop believing. Like you're into that and you're zoned. It's almost an automatic click and there's very few things in life like that. So good games. What do we know about good games? They help us experience the four things we crave the most. This is in that first part of that. Um, and what Jane goes on to talk about is in each successive chapter on good games um, is that they provide us four things. Games are showing us exactly what we want out of life. More satisfying work. Gamers actually love good, hard fun. Mm -hmm. Number two is a better hope of success. Number three is stronger social connectivity, which we saw with our rock band example. Mm -hmm. And number four is the chance to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. That is a key detail for cooperation because we're working on a team towards a common goal. So how have games, especially the best ones, created this sense of community and meaning and purpose and large causes that people contribute to? Jake, I'm going to pause there, and then I'm going to wrap up with our transition into our second draft. So we're going to go through some hacks and some games that people can use to develop more cooperation in their context. Anything stand out so far? A lot. There's, there's a lot to go through uh, and some really good stuff. Um, one thing I wanted to ask is you said you know games limit um, by rules, whatever. I feel like I typically view that as expanding. So I try to I try to approach it from an expansive point of view. In other words, I they're already limited, like as a soccer coach, right? They're already limited by the rules of like an actual soccer game. So I like to try and expand the rules to give them more freedom or more flexibility within the game. Um, yes, they're still limited, I suppose, from a whole, but just a different perspective I have on that is actually. I view it as expanding, right? So, if, okay, you can use your feet, obviously, and you can't use your hands. Well, for this game, you can use your hands and your feet mm -hmm. just to expand and get them more creative um, and and keep it fresh, I guess. So I, I try to actually take things and activities that are maybe well-known and then try to expand on them and give them more creativity and apply rules in different areas uh, limit them in different areas, but I guess from my from my point of view, I'm expanding the game for them instead of limiting the game for them. Yeah, it's just a creative. What you're saying is instead of restricting or like condensing, you're giving something to focus on. So it's like an interesting obstacle. So like you're just there's already an obstacle built within the game, and you're highlighting another obstacle within the game within the game, and that's part of what games when you take that structure does and then if you layer in a flow trigger like novelty or whatever it would be to further play a game within a game that narrows attention and when you narrow attention you get flow and so that's just called good coaching you know and you're doing it intuitively and we're asking if you know these things you can do them explicitly and knowingly and on purposely um so i want to pick on you with that is golf Okay, so so I, the reason why I bring this up is that golf is Bernard Suit's favorite quintessential example of a game. Okay, and I'm gonna make fun of you for this um, because it's really funny when you read it out loud. Okay, so let's take golf to a start. As a golfer, you have a clear goal to get the ball in a very series of a series of very small holes with fewer tries than anyone else. If you weren't playing a game, you'd achieve this goal most the most efficient way possible. You'd walk right up to each hole and drop the ball in with your hand. What makes golf a game is that you willingly agree to stand really far away from each hole and swing at the ball with a club. Golf is engaging exactly because you, along with all the other players, have agreed to make the work more challenging than it has any reasonable right to be. <laughs> Add to that a challenge, a reliable feedback system. You both have the objective measurement of whether or not the ball makes it in the hole, plus the tally of how many strokes you've made. And you have a system that not only allows you to know when and if you've achieved the goal, but also holds out the hope of potentially achieving the goal in increasingly satisfying ways, in fewer strokes, against more players, in different approaches, with different clubs, with all the things you were saying. So I know you've taken up golf. Does that resonate with you? I mean, wh what about the game of golf sticks out to you? 
Uh, I mean, I was actually going to kind of comment this on just the soccer um, being my other main sport in the sense that for the longest time, my world revolved around putting this little ball into a rectangle with a net and how silly that was and how much passion <laughs> and practice um, and and enjoyment I had out of that. When you break it down into that, it seems so silly. Uh, I think golf is probably the ultimate example of that, that you're willingly making something much more difficult than it needs to be. Um, but at the same time, I think what sticks out to me, especially with the golf community, is how there is such a community around it. Like we've taken this thing, made it way too difficult, and now we're all going to bond over it. And it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all suffer together. Unfairly. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so I, you know, I mean, I look at it just as, as soccer. You look at it any sport. You break it down that way. Like I'm, I'm passionate about this guy chucking a ball at me as hard as he can, and I'm trying to take the stick thing, and I'm trying to hit it over that their wall. And uh, let's all let's all practice to that endeavor, shall we, guys? <laughs> let's see if we can do that better than they can do it. It's, well, it. It's funny. It, it, it's hilarious. And so, you know, I know when we talked about reclaiming conversation in the last one, you know, it's a lot of face to face. We're going to get to the face to face thing. But I I want you to know how untapped this is, because I started with that quote about the warning. Correct. Mm -hmm. Here's why that's interesting, because you and I lived through this era. OK, this book is not new. And I want you to know that by the age of 21. The average young American, this is over a decade ago, Jake, has spent somewhere between two and 3,000 hours reading books and more than 10,000 hours playing computer and video games. With each year after 1980 year born, those, these statistics are increasingly likely to be true. 10,000 hours for context, people, is the same number Malcolm Gladwell suggested for world-class expertise in his book, Outliers. Every young person who plays 10,000 hours of anything is getting good at gaming. Okay. Now I'm going to come back to why that matters, but 10,000 hours is also about on average, the amount of time an American student spends in the classroom from the moment they start fifth grade all the way through high school graduation, if they have perfect attendance. In other words, all the subjects combined through their middle school and high school careers, that is the amount they're spending gaming. So to throw that out, unnecessarily or like haphazardly is so stupid when you could just leverage the context they're already playing in and apply it to your sport because i think sports are a lot more like a classroom sometimes than they are like a sport mm -hmm. now here, jane asked a really good question and we'll transition here she said which brings us to the million dollar question of the for the future what exactly are gamers getting good at over the years it has become increasingly clear to me that gamers especially online gamers of any type are exceptionally skilled at one of the most important things, collaboration. In fact, I believe online gamers are the most collaborative people on earth. Interesting. Now, the two, two last things I want to say is cooperation is innate. So there was a study done um, about kids, like two-year-olds, and they had him playing a game and then this like little puppet came in and started messing up the game with like different rules and the children immediately and universally object to the bad behavior and attempt to correct the puppet in order to keep the game successfully going so we have this innate like shared intentionality that when we're in a game together we want to help others learn the rules of the game what and it's essentially what makes us human so we are literally inclined from the moment we're born in a game context to cooperate with one another so what i'm saying is is if you put somebody in a game context even a simple version of a game you are naturally automatically almost instantaneously going to get cooperation and back on 266 as we transition to our kind of our hacks here is 206 let me put it that way is this is one the one thing i want to push home if i haven't already one of the most vital powers of gameplay is it gives us explicit permission to do things differently. We are accustomed to being asked to, um, to behave and think and unconventionally in a game. We're used to being creative and playing outside of social norms when we're inside the socially safe magic circle of a game. And that's a, a term 
that Jake was mentioning with soccer. In outside of a magic circle, outside of a game, you're kicking a ball into a net. That's not a game. That's just uh, what you're doing. But in a game, you're scoring a goal. Okay, so once you step within that magic circle, that designer container that is a game, it has a totally different approach. And it is that binary. So if you can learn and steal how other games, especially good games that kids are already playing, you will achieve more cooperation, among other things. We're just looking at cooperation today. Um, but that's what we're looking for um, in our case for games for cooperation. All right, Jake, What anything you want to add before we transition to some hacks and some games that we could copy for some strategies for cooperation? Um, you know, as you were talking, in specifically video games, but even within video games, how much they have changed. So when I think of video games and how we were raised on video games, we were always together when we played them. Like online gaming wasn't a thing really. It started maybe late high school for us. Uh, otherwise, that was pretty low. Uh, most of our gaming was in person. Now, a significant portion of gaming is not in person. Now you're interacting with somebody who is, I mean, I want to say nameless. They do have a gamer tag. <laughs> so I guess you can, they technically have a name. Uh, predominantly faceless um, and so we are I, I'd be curious how that's kind of how that's coming into play right games are, are cooperating if I'm taking a look at our audience and you know I think my biggest message out of out of this whole I just cut to the chase my biggest message to coaches out of this whole thing would be become game designers yeah. right uh, to to increase cooperation engagement etc Um but as you're doing it, understanding that a lot of the gaming that your players are doing are probably not face to face. And so they're having new and different challenges to that that maybe they haven't had before. Yep. Um, but so uh, that was one thing that popped in my head that I would I would bring up to the audience is there is that level of their interaction with gaming a lot is not in person anymore. Mm -hmm. and so cooperating in person is probably a, a newer activity for nah, not as familiar of an activity uh, as it maybe once was. So um, making sure they're communicating in person appropriately, et cetera, et cetera, is, is a bigger deal than it probably has been in the past. Yeah. And Jane does give recommendations in the appendix. We'll get to those in our, after our most valuable idea, but that is a worthy point. Um, because it does come up. So, and it contradicts more or less what Cherry Turkle is suggesting is that it removes our ability to understand tone and face to face, you know, interactions and empathy. There is ways around that. Um, and we'll get to that. That's a nuance. So, let's start off with the hacks, Jake. So, I'm going to give you three. You can highlight what you like. Then, I'm going to give you three more hacks. And these are different things that would contribute to more cooperation. Then, I have some games that we can adapt for our context of athletics. And so the games were made for a very specific purpose, but if you make a subtle mod or adaption to them, you could use it in our context. So these are all very tactical and practical, whereas Reclaiming Conversation was a little bit more philosophical. Um, Ego's Enemy was much more tactical and practical, and Group Genius was more comprehensive. So this is, I wanna get nitty gritty here. So let's start off, Jake, with the first three hacks. The first one, is World of Warcraft. Now, did you play World of Warcraft ever, Jake? No. I will admit I did not either. Uh, I am aware of it. In some games I don't play, particularly for the reason of I don't want to get addicted to them, right? You know, like if you start something, you just have to keep playing it. This was probably one of those times. Not that I'm against the content, but I'm an athlete. Nonetheless, what can we learn from World of Warcraft? Well, World of Warcraft is the single most powerful IV drip of productivity ever created. Okay, when you are in World of Warcraft, there's no such thing as unemployment. Now, how did they do that? Well, in essence, it's really down to two things. So, I mean, you can get to all the shiny stuff and the server and like all these world. Let's remove all that. Let's, like you said, really break it down. Here's what you need. 
satisfying work. This is in the more satisfying work section. Gamers, what gamers really love most is getting better. Satisfying work always starts with two things, a clear goal and actionable next steps. You are going to do, I mean, there's even a cool little script, but it's really a clear goal, why it matters, actionable steps, where to go, step-by-step -step instructions for what to do when you get there in a concrete measure of proof. Uh, Sonia Lubomirsky said the fastest way to improve someone's everyday quality of life is to bestow on them a specific goal, something to do and look forward to. And it's just slightly better than what you can do. So without getting too deep into World of Warcraft, if you can literally narrow down and say, hey, you have a good chance of success here, clear goal, here's how to do it. We're missing that. I watch a lot of practices and coaching and I'm not trying to critique, but there's a very lack of clear goals and like how to do it. Step one, step two, step three. Good games, there's no ambiguity there, right? I mean, there's no doubt that, it, you know, here's what your goal is. Here's why it matters. Here's where you should go. Here's your instructions. Here's your proof of completion, like when you've won. We need to get away from the, oh, it's just a game. No, it's not just a game. Okay, so that's our World of Warcraft hack. The next one is, is called Happy Embarrassment or trash why every team should trash talk. Now this is right up your alley with KG, Jake. And I, I didn't have time to figure out if KG had any rules for trash talking or anybody in the NBA. But here's what I want you to know about trash talking. Under the happy embarrassment section for stronger social connectivity. All right. It's gently teasing each other in a way that makes them feel good. And it, the most effective way to tease each other is through trash talking. Now, some coaches don't allow this, and there is a wrong way to do it. So I want to acknowledge that. But listen to this stuff, Jake. Trash talking, when it's playful, way, is a, it's a playful way to insult your competition, is almost as important as to our enjoyment of social network games as the actual score of the gameplay. We crave the distinctly rewarding feeling we get from a good game when we soundly beat or are beaten by people we really like. More importantly, we crave the experience of teasing each other about it in private and in public. It gets better. So why, why is uh, teasing really good for her from a research standpoint? It's an invaluable role in helping us form and maintain positive relationships. Number one, it confirms trust. A person doing the teasing is demonstrating the capacity to hurt, but simultaneously showing that the intention is not to hurt. It's just like a dog with a play bite. Another dog... Um, to show that it wants to be friends. We bear our teeth to each other, remind each other that we could bite you, but we never really would. Number two is by allowing somebody to tease us. This is huge for kids to learn. We confirm our willingness to be in a vulnerable position. We are actively demonstrating our trust in another person's regard for their emotional well-being. We're letting someone else feel powerful, giving them a, a brief moment of higher status in our social relationships and humans are intensely attuned to shifts in social status by letting someone else experience higher status we intensify the, their positive feelings for us why because we naturally like people more when they enhance our own social status so you get like stuff like this like when you tease somebody gaze aversion bowed head nervous smile hand touching on the face like oh all of that with like that stupid sheepish smile um so the research shows that we mostly tease and let ourselves be teased because it feels good. But the reason why is it feels good is that builds trust and makes us more likable. And number three, we can lower our status to strengthen our relationships by acting si silly. I call this the gronk. Party games like Rock Band are meant to be played socially face-to-face -face and easy to pick up the first time you try. So you remember like Anchorman where it's like, you know, like don't go for the face and, and you know, you can't talk about mothers. Uh -huh. I think trash talking is really interesting as a, you know, teaching people to trash talk and that give and take like, Oh, you went over the line. No, you went over the line. Like it's like the Sandlot scene, but I think that's a little bit more on the negative side. Number three, Jake, and I'll let you, let you dig into any of these three is notches or vicarious pride. And this is right after that same section. It's the number eight out of 10 list of emotions that gamers say they want to experience. So a notch is the Yiddish word for the bursting pride when we feel when someone else we've taught or mentored succeeds, rank below, just below surprise and fear. It's when we mentor somebody and we can't help but like, they did it, like, yes! It's kind of that emotion coaches experience, right? 
my suggestion for that vicarious pride is that players mentor each other. So if you have somebody who's a good shooter and they mentor somebody who's just brand new, we need more of that mentoring within. So instead of the coach always orchestrating everything or even players, it's like, hey, one of the best things you can do as a captain is to take a young kid under your arms and show them how to do something. Yeah, there are several levels below you and you're inching them forward. So like when you teach them and then you go watch the JV game right before the varsity game and they score a goal, you freak out. Like, yeah, they did it. Like they pulled left, they went right, they kicked top left, score. Like you freak out. So some of the first three hacks are World of Warcraft, especially the clear games, clear goals and instructions, more trash talking for cooperation and mentoring for vicarious pride. So what do you take from that? And on what stands out for cooperation's sake? I love the trash talking one. Um, I, I think you know that because someone has probably taken more of my trash talk than any other human on planet. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Uh, still to this day, I'll remind you of things that happened years ago at your expense. Uh, I, I just love the way that's articulated. I think a lot of people see it as a surface engagement with, with between two people. Um, and certainly it can be nasty. Um, it can be a sandlot situation, <laughs> which is funny, but yeah, probably not appropriate for two people who like each other to talk that way. Um, but at the same time, to that point, the only times I've quoted that movie to my friends, right? Like, you play ball like a girl. Obviously, it's sarcastic, but there's a little, like, because of this scenario, there might be a little bit of truth to it, but I, I, I love the way you articulated it because it's so true and how it shows trust between two people. Um, I mean, I often tell people, like, one, if, if I start making fun of you, that's when you know that I, I love you, and that's, that's mm -hmm. when you know that we're, we're on the up and up and, and have a good connection and vibe because I don't, I don't make fun of people that I don't know. Like, I, I would yeah. feel incredibly uncomfortable with that um so i think that's that's a really important one and then the the mentoring piece is such an interesting one to me that i definitely want to get in and try as a coach sometime um i think that that can be done even amongst peers uh and the way that it's articulated you know, i've been taught that hey when you can if you, if you have a player that's really good at something use them to demo whatever you're trying to, mm -hmm. to work on but trying to make that connection maybe more intimate and saying not just don't just demo, demo it for the group. This player is really struggling with this. Why don't you go over there and, and show them, see if you can give them a few pointers um, to be able to do it and replicate what you're doing. It, it's something that I'm very interested in trying because I think there could be real, real good payoff, not only from that player getting better at that activity, but um, communication and, and collaboration and cooperation amongst the team. Yeah, and in, in education, we have like, crazy schedules it's like an a day or a b day and that tells you what to do right it's really when we went back to group genius with key, key sawyer we brought up um pick up basketball right and now really neither of us had like a time where we were able to improv and make up our own moves our own shots and like starting a practice that way in the basketball sense another method you could do is like starting with a mentoring time so everybody knows like who's good at what but you're gonna you pair up, triple up, you know, and you're going to work together in like a small group or one on one where that's how you start practice. It's not one on one day. It's a notch day or however you say this, nacho libre. Let's go with that. That's funny. Um, but you set up that time where it's a mentoring session. You take 15 minutes and you're going to teach somebody, you know, here's how I do this, you know, and, and that allows not only the player who's good at it to, to break it down and to become a teacher and have the opportunity to learn how to coach but also the younger players and you're creating a culture of like, we help each other around here. Like one day you might be me, you know, and, and some people might get left, left out there. Some skills not as cool as others. And yeah, but everybody's got something they can teach, you know, whether it's down, like downwards or parallel or however you want to describe that. So mm -hmm. I agree with that. That's so interesting to me. And the trash talking I want to make the point is don't rob the kids of that. Like obviously monitor it, but don't cut it out arbitrarily like include the trash talk, like even between the coach, right? And it's it, it that's what play is for, is it's a platform or games. So we learn how to do that. If any time in society we need the ability to tease each other for our viewpoints and other things, 
let's learn how to do that in a safe space of athletics. Mm -hmm. Right. We take ourselves so stupidly seriously. Um, and the ability to have like a coach or a captain be untouchable, you know, beyond approach, that's stupid. You know, don't rob your team of cooperation just because you don't want them to trash talk. Teach them how to trash talk. Not the other team. I meant each other. There's a difference. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. All right. All right. Second set. The the Gen Ratio Nike Plus Power Song and WWE Belts S through Four Squares The Mayor. So the Gen Ratio is from Datcher Keltner. I'm not going to get that name right. But it's a mathematical method for measuring the social well-being of any shared environment. So coaches, is there anybody? You can measure the cooperation and collaboration of your team right now it's called the gen ratio from the ancient chinese word for human kindness it compares the total positive interactions between strangers or a team to the total negative interactions in a given time and in a given place the higher the ratio the better social well-being the lower the poorer the social well-being to measure a gen ratio space you simply watch it very closely for a fixed amount of time like a practice or a game you count up all the positive and negro micro micro interactions between them keeping track of the two different totals, how many times people will smile or act kindly towards one another, their smiles, thank yous, a door being held open, a concern question, get tallied on the left side. And on the right side, if they're sarcastic comments, not teasing, eye rolls, excuse bump, someone cursing under the breath, they get tallied on the right side. Very interesting concept is the gen ratio is a simple but powerful way to predict whether being in a particular place will make us happier or unhappy. So that's an interesting one. In the Nike Plus, now this is in the older technology. This is when it would track like you're running, right? And so you get this little avatar and it'll tell you how fast you ran. You had actually had to put a chip in your shoe. Um, but like any good massively multiplayer online game, you advance Nike Plus levels at first, but over time it takes more and more effort to reach the next level. But what I really liked out of this was they had a motivational feature, Jake. It was called the Power Song. It's the musical equivalent of a health pack or a power up in a video game. Whenever you need a boost of energy or extra motivation to keep running or pick up speed, you simply hold down the center button like on the iPod or iPad or whatever, or iPhone. The quick gesture automatically triggers your favorite song. And it's like the super secret thing where, you know, you get this like boost. It's like the boost button. I think that's super interesting. If like you call the timeout and you're like your team's tired and you're drained and all you do is like you get the boom box up and you just play this like but if you have thought about this, like think about this if you had a team and you identified in practice like okay here's the song that gets us jacked when we flip this switch we're going and to only use it selectively when you need that extra boost so let's just say you're doing a, a, a drill or something and you're going for a personal record you put the song do, do, you crank it up to 11. There's all sorts of really great Bluetooth boom boxes these days. And you go. That's cooperation. Because now we're all in the same message. We all have the same thing. I know that's not a game necessarily, but that's an element within a game that allows you to push even further. So I thought that was super cool. I'm, I'm very curious what your song would be. And then the last one was a game called Foursquare. And it was this face-to-face -face interaction game. So if you visited somewhere, uh, like a coffee shop, you could say you're there and then other people could join you. So every time you checked into the coffee shop, you got points. And the people who had the most check-ins at a certain place were named the mayor of that place. So to transfer that to our world in athletics, I really have always been fascinated with like WWE belts in sports. Like just who is the world champion of shooting? Who is the tag team champion of blank and the ability to run that drill see who wins you get it for like a defined period of time like two weeks and then you have to have people go against you again and be able to rotate through different belts and be the mayor or the champion of fascinates me to no end because i know if i had a backpack or if i was a player i would carry that wwe belt everywhere and i would let everybody know i'm on top i'm the rebounding champion whatever champion that you give drills you make um super fun so we have gen ratio jake nike power song possibly the song you would you would pick and then what you think of wwe belts as signifiers of social status in terms of 
you know, PRs and, and, and competing against each other. You know, the power song, I would go, it could be anything, right? Like, but just have a trigger. Um, a story that comes to mind is uh, I was coaching and some kid just was phenomenal. That it was a practice, it was a training session. Um, and was just like, hey, he didn't made one wrong decision. He was all over the place. Da 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 da. And so, kind of called the team in. And just like the first day, I looked at him I was like, "What got into you this morning? Who is this guy?" And he mm -hmm. just looks at me deadpan and goes, well, "I had a couple hot dogs for breakfast, so I'm probably well filled." <laughs> right. And and so, <laughs> like, if you took that and said, "Okay, well, guys, anytime we need to take it to the next level, we're just gonna start yelling hot dogs until we figure it out that we need to take it to the next level." And it's something comical and whatever, but like you could take that to a game and like, hey, we're kind of slacking. If I just stood up and said, gentlemen, hot dogs, they could all kind of like they could have used that as a rallying cry. Like that's as simple as it can be. To kind of look around at each other and be like, oh, yeah, okay, we need to step it up. Hot dogs, hot dogs, boys. So it really could be anything. Um, it could be a song, it could be just something that you made a connection to in practice. Uh, you could just create essentially a power up word, right? When we say this word, we play our power up, right? Um, kind of a deal. Uh, if I had to pick a song, I... I'm not going to put you on the spot, but... Yeah, I, it would. It could be an Eminem song. It could be Seven Nation Army. Mm -hmm. Um... Mm -hmm. It might be a Linkin Park song or two that could fit in there. That's where I would go. That's what I listened to back in the day to get me geared. Yeah. Oh, and to give you credit, like, I mean, I remember reading Underdogs about Brad Stevens and Butler University, especially when Gordon Hayward was there and it was this like rise this before he went to, um, Brad Stevens went to Boston. But he would do that kind of stuff. Like, he, it would be the super tense moment of a game and he would be, he would bring that laughter and levity like just completely unrelated. I couldn't even take like, imagine high schoolers or so middle schoolers. They, I wouldn't know what to do as the opposing team. If the other team came out and broke a team huddle saying hot dogs, I'm like, what the <laughs> are you supposed to do with that? <laughs> you know? So it's very funny. Um, it's those little things that, you know, like we're obviously giving strategies for cooperation, like in there's uh, innumerable amounts. And these are, are different things that get brought up in, in within a game. Um, I do think it's worth building out those, champions of as much as you can mm -hmm. you know in, in all the different ways because you get what you incentivize and mm -hmm. that allows you to track milestones and memories across a season and you know see who retains the belt who is the final champion and you know you give it away but it's little things like that that make a huge difference in terms of whether your team is working together toward a goal and and to that point like i love the wwe title belt thing you know, WWE, this might come a shock to some people, is scripted, right? So there's someone putting forth a storyline. Why I bring that up is you know, if you have one kid who's winning the belt all of the time, step in and script something, right? So like, hey, you're just doing one, one-on-ones, and whoever, you know, wins the one-on-one gets the belt, right? Like we're taking a true WWE style one-on-one -on -one match. <laughs> well, then throw in a referee that's a player. Tell the player, like, hey, I want you to call everything against him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want you to give such a clear and distinct advantage to the other one, right? Um, you know, talk about trash talk. You want to talk about dealing with adversity in a fun and playful game-like way. You've just identified it, uh, and I think it would be a great a great thing that would, would create team unity and cooperation. Yep. Now, let's go to five games. Now, we're going to mod these. Um for how you could apply these elements for more cooperation. Jane has such a vast experience, and this is an old book now, oldish, um, but these are games that have done amazing things that it's almost stupid not to steal their brilliance, okay? Now, Jake, did you, how much did you play Halo? I know you're a PlayStation guy, but did you ever get into Halo? Uh, yeah, I did a little bit in college. Okay, fair enough. Why do I bring up Halo? So this is in the chapter of becoming a part of something bigger than ourselves. This is April 2009 to date us. You could easily use Call of Duty more recently or some of these other games um, that have come out. 
But Halo 3 is very specific because they celebrated in April 2009 a spine tingling mindstone. 10 billion kills against their virtual enemy, the Covenant. That was 500 in 565 days, 17.5 million kills a day, 730,000 per hour, and 12,000 a minute. More than 15 million people did this. And that's roughly the total number of active personnel of all 25 of the largest armed forces in the real world combined at that time. They embraced 10 billion kills as the symbol uh, of just how much the Halo community could accomplish. Something bigger than anything any other game community had achieved before. All right. Now, why does that matter? Because it produces meaning. Meaning of being a part of something bigger than yourself. Um, and then we connect that to our daily actions, to something bigger than ourselves, the bigger, the better. And this allows us to experience awe and happiness. Um, but how did Halo do this? I'm going to give you three things. There is an ec epic context for action. So this collective story that individuals would contribute to. There is an epic environment. If you played Halo or any of these other types of games, they're un unbelievable in terms of the environment you're in. And then the third thing is an epic project. So something so big that it just you can't just do it in one day. It's over time, over years. Um, so that's one thing, you know, to build these, you know, massive cooperative goals. I know hockey and some other things have like how many shots you take in a summer. Now imagine that collectively across a season. All right, guys, we're going to make 1,000 three-pointers in our basketball season. You know, like we're going to make them in the games. We're going to make them in practice. So this overarching goal. That's what Halo did in a very overly, a very overly simplistic um, way. Number two is NCAA Football 10. Jake, you have to remember NCAA Football 10. Love NCAA Football 10. All right. Now, this is something that would require a little coordination, either within your community or even better outside your community. So NCAA Football 10 was this thing called Season Showdown, where every game counts. Um, every game played count towards a national championship. It's not just the real one. So what ended up happening is you named your allegiance and then you played in service of your college team that week. So you would play like however many points you scored versus would be the team you were playing that week. So like the Gophers played the Badgers and there was a virtual score, just like there was the real world score. And so there was this element of, you know, this bigger reality and context. So how can we apply that to our sports context, simple, challenge another team outside of the realm of a game. Could you imagine like, hey, the challenge this week is this drill or this thing as a team. We got 60 seconds to do blank. And you call somebody a, a, like your rival and say, hey, we challenge you this week. Video evidence and you're going to face off against each other. You want to talk about bigger context for you could challenge somebody random online like hey you have an you know have like a buddy who lives in Arizona maybe and he has a basketball team I have a basketball team hey Jake I bet my team could beat your team no you can't that's you want to talk about instant cooperation now it's not just your little team at your dinky little gym on a Wednesday night at 8 p.m. when everybody's tired and cranky with each other now it's like hey guys we got to beat Jake's team winner you know winner gets breaking rights forever so Halo, in terms of this big epic context and on a smaller scale, NCAA football. Do you, what would you take from those two? I mean, have you ever experienced that kind of epic world building and context of a group goal at that scale before in sport? No, and I know you've, you've talked about this before. Um, I think it's it would be a great way to incorporate social media use with your team. Uh, that's kind of the best way to connect all the different teams. I mean, look, if, if you're coaching in a club, um, there are so many possibilities with this to challenge different age groups, to challenge different teams within your age group, um, to challenge different clubs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that could be something that'd be really fun to explore. Uh, think of a challenge, come up with a challenge, right? And see if you can get it to go viral, essentially. Um, you know, but whether it's so most three pointers in a minute, whatever, videotape it. And it's the minute to win it challenge, right? And you throw on the hashtag and then you send out mm -hmm. emails to different coaches like, hey, I'm starting this hashtag. I think it'd be fun if we all did it. Just videotape you know, one of your players, two of your players, whatever. Uh, and let's see who gets the highest score in two weeks, whatever it may be. I think that could create a lot of 
fun cooperation. I think it created a lot of fun community around it. So I think it's it is a great tool. Um, you know, I, the Halo thing is on a bigger scale. I, like, it just goes back to <laughs> goes back to the silliness of what we're doing and how people group around the silliness of what we do, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's hitting a golf ball into a little hole in the ground or whether it's uh, killing bad guys on Halo. It, it's amazing what hum humans are really looking for something to congregate around. They're looking for those common spaces. And Lord knows in this world, we need to find more of those common spaces and talk to each other more. Um, and, and being coaches, being athletes, being parents, where we are very involved with things that people we know will um, group around. Let's let's bring those to the forefront. Let's acknowledge it for what it is, and let's let's unite around them because it's silly and it's fun and uh, it's really good for society and it's really good for individuals. Well, and imagine like this. Here's a quote, and I just it it it's funny. So they talk about the word epic here, and it that being the perfect way to describe it's something that far surpasses the ordinary, especially in size, scale, intensity. Your players are already experiencing this. Okay. And the fact that you don't have it is why they might be checked out. And it doesn't even have to be super crazy. Like you just have to acknowledge that we need a bigger context, but this is the quote. It said, Halo three is epic. Imagine somebody describing your team like this. Your team is epic. It empowers you the way no other team can. It doesn't have moments, but events, experiences that tickle the soul, sending shivers down the spine. You know, that's what that kind of thing does. So yeah. Let's go to the next next three. We got Bounce, which is one of the coolest cooperative. This goes with Sherry Turkle's Reclaiming Conversation. That's episode number three of the series. Um, Bounce, Tombstone Hold'em, and Top Secret Assist Off, not Top Secret Dance Off. So let's start with Bounce, Jake. So Bounce was a game that was invented for senior, senior citizens, the elderly, right? So the goal was to have these senior experience agents um, and you would talk over the phone with them and to find out as many common things you had with that person in 10 minutes and you got up to 10. Okay. So the idea is that, you know, we can use technology and game-based uh, formats in order to serve a larger purpose or having fun with strangers. Right. So the, the challenge is to discover a single answer for each question that is true for both players. Now I'm going to get to the punchline before we try a couple of these. Okay. The punchline, I think that is really interesting for athletics because when we say cooperation, and I've said this with flow before, the more flow you have, the more flow you have. It's, it's, it's a compounding thing. So we've been talking about sometimes that it's within the realm of your practice and your games. Your entire season is this circle of opportunity. So the reason why I say that is it doesn't have to happen at practice. So imagine this, Jake. I can I could not get around this. Is a adult versus kids season long tournament. Here's what I'm saying. Every player on your team, and now this would be a little harder at, at scale, like with like a football, but let's just say it's like a condensed team of a dozen players. You're matched up with another player and their parent. So each week you assign, let's just say, Jake, you have a player, I have a player. Okay, my assignment that week is to call Jake as the player, right? Your kid calls my kid, and we're going to play five minutes. The kids have to answer questions as best as they can and find out what they have in common. And the adults, one adult from either family, or even I would say a sibling would be fine, have to figure out what they have in common. Now, that's a game. Because you can, at the end, play bragging rights. Who wins over the course of the season, the adults or the kids? Now, in this context, it was just younger generations meeting with the senior citizens. But think about this at scale. Over 12, let's just say 12 weeks of a season, your parents now have things in common with each other, and your athletes have found things that they have in common with each other for, what, 10 minutes of effort, 15 tops? I don't care when you call during the week. You just have to do it, right? Yeah. Imagine the trickle effect off of that. So I want to see if you could do this, Jake. There's um, let's do a couple of these things. Um, just to give an example. So, what's somewhere we both swam before? 
What? I don't know. It's just that's what we what's a body of water we both swum in. Have you swum in the Pacific Ocean yet? Uh yeah. Ding ding ding. What's a book you both recommended? Oh. I mean, mm. I could go with the I could go with the easy one and say the good book. Oh right, that's that was the first one that I was like, okay, beyond that, which one that's, would we pick? No, that's two. We're good. Okay. <laughs> what's an this because this one's harder? What's an experience that has made both of you nervous? All right, I'll tell you. Do you remember your first prom or slow dance? I was never been around girls, and then I show up at sixteen to a dance. Scariest thing of all time. Is that did you greed or no? You have something else? No. Oh. No. Okay. Um, how about the first time you kissed a girl? Oh, that was nerve wracking. I never heard okay. the end of that. My legs, Terrible. my legs shook. Both did of my really? legs were shaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember exactly where I was. I'm not going to explain the rest of that story, but I heard about it the next day. Hey, <laughs> did you did you do? I'm like, how did you learn that? Like, that just happened like less than ten hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> I have my, I have my sources. Yes, I was incredibly nervous. But in the game of bounce, there's a like list of 125 questions or something ridiculous list, and you have to orient to like find what you that time, and you get X amount of time and you get a score. But again, like talk about this other format to get into it. Um, very very cool. The next one. It's called Tombstone Hold'em, and I'm going to go really quick here. This is Jane's most controversial game she ever played or made. Um, it was this game where, you know, people won't go into cemeteries, and cemeteries are begging for people to visit them. So she devised a game that you went to the, the graveyard or the, the site, and you she designs things around positive psychology principles, and your goal is to literally stare death in the face. And what you would do is you would you would have like um in poker, like you know, you play five card stud, you would lay cards out, like three cards or five, I guess you could do. And your goal is to go read the type of tombstone that gave you the suit. And then the number, the number was the um like the final date of like when somebody died. So like 1901 is number one. Hi, buddy. So the reason why this is interesting. Is, is if you took the idea of Tombstone Hold'em and you had to play with a partner and you had to come up with a two-pair combination. So Jake touches this tombstone and it's this card and he has to reach over and touch my hand and it's this card and together that's our hand. And you have like five minutes to f get the best hand based on that thing. And so you're, you're staring death in the face. The reason why this is interesting, Jake, is because... It would give you an opportunity to do memento mori and think about death. And I don't mean think about death like as in people literally dying. How about the death of your season? Like here lies the season of 2023. So you could go to a cemetery, play this game, right? Tombstone, what is it called? Tombstone Hold'em. But as a coach at the beginning of the year, you could say, okay, you know, our season's going to come and go too. What do we want it to be remembered for? And that could be a catalyst for a conversation of what, what traits do you want to define your season? You know, remember the Titans did that, you know, they went to this run late at night and he had this speech and now they, they weren't deliberately talking about them dying, but they talked about how others had died. So it's this really interesting context. And I just got so excited about it. So that's number two. I'm just trying to picture. I'm glad you included the, the Titans thing, but I'm just trying to picture like, I already have enough kooky ideas that parents like, what in the world is this guy doing for me to send out an email or just announce like, Hey, tomorrow's practice. <laughs> We're going to a graveyard. Don't worry about it. Everybody. I can't imagine the looks that I would get. I, it would be I mean, awful. I'm trying to, but I, I don't know that I can. Yeah, but if you're not playing ghost in the graveyard in a little game graveyard, are you really playing? <laughs> yeah, that's true. You're not. <laughs> um, but the last game is called Top Secret Dance Off, and it was this idea that dancing, is, especially with other people in coordination, is so huge. To dance is to trust. It's the most reliable and quickest route to the mysterious feeling that has gone many names over three generations. Sympathy, agape, ecstasy, gen. Here I'll call it trust, according to Dr. Keltner again. But the game was Top Secret Dance Off. It was a whole different thing. What I wanted to 
redub this was top secret assist off. So John Wooden said that the assist was the epitome of cooperation. But what did he actually demand his players do? And this is where I want to have a little bit of creativity as a game. He asked that when you made an assist, the player who scored had to point at the player who got, got him the ball. So what I, I've seen this before in volleyball where there's like certain celebrations they are called Firos, that moment of pride where like, a, you know, they make an ace and then the, the group of six girls do a thing. Then the bench does it. And then the fans do that. I would love a team for cooperation's sake to design as many assist dances or handshakes. It's like, you know, you could, you could do it all. I mean, kids are so creative, but if you're in basketball, I'd say, and you wanted to do the shake and bake. So I passed Jake the ball, he scores. You'd be like, shake and bake. Like you'd have like a single out and a single return. And you could even play paper, rock, scissors. Like where I put out rock and then you put out paper. Like you would have to beat the other person. Like you imagine that in a game. So the, and this is cool because, you know, the dancing, like you don't have to do the haka, right? I mean, that, that does have a deliberate advantage with the endorphins and the group synchronization coming together at dancers high of euphoria. Um, but you can do it in smaller ways, you know, having those customizable handshakes, doing certain things at certain intervals of a game um, that bring people together. I think is fascinating. So Jake, that's the review. We got bounce this game between players and adults, finding what's in common once a week, tombstone, hold them thinking about death. And then this top secret assist off where you have these hidden handshakes and rituals that produce more cooperation. Let's just grab them all three because I think this is the most important thing that comes out of this. Because you can be really creative in generating cooperation. Like there are such a sea of things to do to get people to come together, whether that's going to a graveyard, whether that's just creating a game for them to talk, um, whether that's nonverbal communication like you just laid out. There are so many ways to get people to cooperate. I would encourage you to be creative. I would encourage you. There's no reason you can't make it work within your team because you just you can be so creative. Um, and and so the other thing I'd point to too is give them autonomy to do it. Yeah. Um, as well, you know. Uh, obviously, you want to guide it, but hey, we're looking for more cooperation here. Okay. Um, let's play a game. Let's let's find a game. Okay. The game is, you know. You get a point every time you acknowledge a person who gave you an assist. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that look like? Who knows? Who cares? Let them come up with something. <laughs> right? You just be there like, oh, okay, yeah, so all right, it's a point. Um, and then maybe at the end of it, maybe at the end of like the first game, you notice like, hey, hey, I saw, you know, Timmy got three points. I saw that um, for acknowledging the person who assisted them. And Johnny got two. Um, and Brad got one, but Brad, you had the most creative way of acknowledging it. So I'm giving you a bonus points of four points. Yep. And just then you've just triggered them all to be like, Oh, right. And then Brad gets a, Brad gets a belt. Brad gets some sort of thing that he carries with him to the next game. Yep. Right. And you can keep a running total. You can do it game by game. Um, but once they start, once you've opened the door, like, Hey, you can be as creative as you want and I'll give you bonus points for it. Who knows what they're going to do. Oh, exactly. And I just imagine this, like if you had a different handshake for each player on the floor, like you're in basketball, let's say, like people would emulate that. Like it'd be like, there's a certain amount of style and remember it's top secret. So, but if you were watching it as an observer, you're like, what are they doing? Like, I mean, but you, you've created a context where it's like, Hey guys, this is a secret. And you're automatically myelinating, stealing from our talent code episode, cooperation, myelination of cooperation, which sounds fun. And I can um, I can just see the kids. I'm just thinking of basketball here specifically, but I can just see the kids be like, oh wait. So if he points at him because he assisted them, he gets a point. Well, coach, even if he didn't assist me and I point at the person who got the assist, do I still get a point? And you should say, Yes. Yes. <laughs> and just watch. The ball will go through the hoop and everyone on the floor will turn to the person who got the assists and do something ridiculous. And think of the just think of the camaraderie that that would create, you know. Um, I love the, the volleyball example, right, of how it, like, transitions from the people on the floor to the bench to the crowd. We don't really do that in any other sport, but it's awesome. Why, why don't we? Like, just imagine you're sitting at an AAU game, and all of a sudden someone gets an assist. Everyone on the floor points to them, the bench points to them. All of a sudden all the parents are pointing to them. Like, what the heck is going on? You can't help but not smile at that situation. Oh, talk about a sixth man. 
I mean, like, I would then want to create assist just so I could do the thing. Like, dude, we need an assist today. Like, we got to run our thing. And you could, like, switch them up. Like, the entire concept is so fat. And, like, that's beyond just your teaching of the sport. Mm -hmm. Like, this mm -hmm. could become a thing. So we need to wrap up. I'm going to breeze through this last portion. I'm going to combine metaphors and the practical advice for gamers. And then I'll finish with most valuable ideas. But I love it. So three metaphors. Um, there were more. I didn't make any two crazy ones, but why games for cooperation? Well, games are like the UPS. They are the delivery of cooperation. They're not like the actual packet or they are like the actual package. They deliver you more cooperation. So if you can package it up, your cooperation, like a game, you're going to get it. It's instant delivery. Never fails. Just like US mail, their slogan. It's also an ultimatum. So games and cooperation is an ultimatum. And what I mean by that is that we do really have this collaborate or perish. It's perhaps the single most urgent rallying cry of our times. So as a team, like you need to come together. What are you doing? Right. You, you know, the best teams are the ones that cooperate and, you know, they have these other variables that wouldn't says, but there's an ultimatum to collaborate or, or die. And a good game is an investigation. And we've seen that through a lot of the games and strategies we talked about. And that came from Albert Einstein, who said games are the most elevated form of investigation. And what he meant is he described games as an elevated form is when people play a game of any sorts, it becomes a massively collaborative study of a problem, an extreme scale test of potential action in a specific possibility space. Fancy way of saying, Jake, you're going to figure out how do you get that stupid golf ball into the stupid hole? Right now we're instantly, we're in the, in the magic circle. We're got to figure this out. Practical advice for gamers. And I'll, I'll wrap up with, uh, probably the most valuable idea. I'll save them for a post. Um, but practical advice for gamers, Jake, I want to finish with that. And then one most valuable idea. Here's them. I won't read into them except the numbers. Number one, don't play more than 21 hours a week. We did talk about that in super better too. 21 hours is that. Number two, playing with real life friends and family is better than playing alone all the time or strangers. Number three, playing face to face with friends and family beats playing them online every time. Number four, cooperative gameplay overall has more benefits than competitive gameplay. Number five, creative games have special positive impacts. And then there's two more. Six, you can get all the benefits of a good game without realistic violence. You or your kids don't have to play games with guns or gore. And number seven, any game that makes you feel bad is no longer a good game for you to play. All right. Anything on metaphors or practical advice for gamers that you like or any metaphors you would come up with from what we talked about? I like the UPX, FedEx, USPS metaphor. Um, you just have to – a game is just something that you have to, to deliver. And it will it will do the rest for you. You just got to package it, and you can be creative in how you package it. And you just got to deliver it, and the rest will take care of itself. So that's the one I I connected with most. I agree. I'm gonna pick one most valuable idea. There are several. Um, each of them really spoke to the essence of games and why they produce cooperation. Um, very good, good book, heavy book to get through. Um, I think I'll end with this one. Um, this is probably one of my f favorites. Yeah, let's, let's do this. Here we go. So three key values we share in common with the ancient Lydians. So the Lydians played games um, during a famine. They played games one day and fasted, and then the next day they um, actually ate. So they did this for 18 years. But Primary function of games, to provide real positive emotions, real positive experiences, and real social connections during a difficult time. This is still the primary function of games today. They serve to make our real lives better, and they serve this purpose beautifully, better than any other tool we have. No one is immune to boredom or anxiety, loneliness, or depression. Games solve these problems of cooperation even quickly, cheaply, and dramatically. Life is hard, and games make us better. Games are a way of creating a new civic and social infrastructure. They are the scaffold for coordinated effort. Games help us work together to achieve massively more. Good stuff. Good stuff. Which, which, which of these things 
would you apply first, Jake? Just in a conclusion. So I'll review World of Warcraft, Trash Talking, Notches, Gen Ratio, The Power Song, WWE Belts, Halo 3, NCAA Football, The Parent versus Athlete, Balanced Conversation Game, Tombstone Hold'em, Top Secret Assist Off. Um, which would you like take and like, hey, I got to try that? Like, if I was, if, if it was in season or right before season, I'm trying that one next. Uh, I think for practicality's sake and and how creative and fun, I would say the WWE belt. I think that would be the easiest one to implement. Eh. It would be the quickest one to implement. Uh, maybe it would be a better way to put it. Um, and kids would, would instantly respond to it. And you could be creative of, of finding different ways uh, of awarding it uh, or who it goes to. So that's the one I would say that stands out. I agree with that one. I, I'm really fascinated by the the bounce you know, between players and parents. That's such an untapped source. And I really think like this regional pre and post contest, like a tournament, like we have like at the National Sports Center, like the World Cup. Imagine if we had a combine version of that, like where you got together as like the 50 teams in the state of Minnesota for basketball for 12U basketball. You had a pre-judging and a post-judging, and you got to see how much better you got throughout the year as a team and individuals. That's fascinating to me. I think that's mm -hmm. a dream. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like the belts belts too, mostly because I just want one. I just want I want to be John Cena for a day. <laughs> Make a wish, Jake. All right, mm -hmm. well, that is number four. We're a couple minutes over. Uh, number four out of five of cooperation, reality is broken, why games, uh, how, how and why games make us better and how they can change the world. That's how we cooperate more. We went through several games including cemeteries and other things. Um, do check it out, the rest of the series, Group Genius, Ego's Enemy, Reclaiming Conversation. We got one more to go to wrap up cooperation, and then we'll finish the entire foundation before we move up to the next block, which is self-control. Uh, but thank you for listening. Thank you for learning along with us. Uh, we appreciate it. Had a lot of fun today, as always, um, whether you are a rock band aficionado or not. <laughs> You're, yeah, I don't think I've ever even heard you do the voice of it. It's still the drums. But any final words, Jake? Be a game designer. Be a game designer. Whether you're a coach, whether you're a parent, uh, or whether you're a player, you can still design games for your teammates. So be a game designer. Well said. Thanks for listening, everybody. See ya. Thanks, everyone. Bye.